So, thank you for this interview. Thank you too. Uh, if you can please, for the record, state your name, education and occupation. Okay, my name is Anton Psich and uh, my education is basic school, middle school and uh, occupation I am connected with advertisement. Thank you. Okay, my first question is very openly phrased, very general. Why is this war happening? This war happening because uh, we have bad neighbor near us who is imperialistic and who is still uh, living by the old stuff which they had in past. A little bit more specifically, I'd like to dig into the Russian narrative. The narrative of the Russian Federation about why this invasion is happening. Now they're projecting a variety of reasons, but we can mostly condense them into three categories. Denazification of Ukraine. Pro they, they need to protect, they say, the Russian uh, speaking and, Ru and ethnically Russian populations that have been suffering uh, a genocide, they say, in, in Donbass. And finally, uh, a perceived threat from the ever-expanding NATO. Mm -hmm. What is your response to that? For uh, the last uh, about NATO, it's like no one made uh, anything more expanding threat of NATO than Russia made in past 30 days. So like they uh, completely... First of all, of course, uh, NATO is, uh, showed themselves as useless uh, piece of organization, you know, because they didn't do nothing. They didn't blow the skies, they didn't do almost anything what they should do. But uh, anyway, like uh, this uh, NATO stuff, Russia only work on it to make it bigger and that uh, Ukraine in the end of the war uh, will join the net or something like this or something similar organization, let's say. About the uh, save the Russian speakers, like uh, I'm by myself uh, also a Russian speaker, whole life. Uh, I was uh, born in Ukraine and my family from my uh, mother uh, side they all from Russia, uh, but like uh, we all live uh, here for 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 like last more than 40 years, let's say, even more. Uh, so like uh, even uh, when it was 2014, uh, the war, Maidan, all the stuff, and when it became like this that we need to save uh, Russian speakers, we need to save them, and all the stuff, but. Um, I never saw uh, that uh, really someone trying to offend anyone who is speaking Russian. Even in so-called like uh, Lviv city, uh, when I was coming there, or my friends, everyone is, was speaking Russian, and uh, no one didn't have any issue with this. Like no problem, no one said, "Oh, what the fuck? Why do you speak uh, Russian? It's any language or something like this." Like it's. Uh, it's not important, uh, it's not that, doesn't have that high role in uh, our life. Of course, some uh, politicians, uh, they tried to bring this uh, question, like uh, that we should have everything in Ukraine, and yes, okay, because it's Ukraine, it should be like this, like official language and everything, like everywhere, like in Spain, it's Spanish, uh, and blah, 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 blah. So, it's okay, but like uh, in some way, some politicians bring it on too high, uh, like say, uh, level uh, of not uh, clarifying what they want to do, but of uh, like trying to find, um, I don't know how to say it uh, in English, uh, trying to find. Uh, some uh, dots when they can uh, say that Russian is useless and like uh, they made some videos it was uh, really like uh, stupid videos but anyway it wasn't that uh, big you know it's not uh, it wasn't uh, spread for whole countries that uh, uh, 
everything must be like this uh, that uh, children's name must be changed to the ukrainian pronunciation or something like this it uh, wasn't that uh, important and uh, for like again like as with nato for now russia made uh, everything that every ukrainian uh, citizen started to speak ukrainian because even me i'm trying to speak ukrainian because uh, like uh, I know Ukrainian, but I usually don't use it. But uh, I guess till the end of the war, I will speak Ukrainian uh, completely because, like, uh, because all of this situation, because they bring this uh, to that high level that they must protect Russian speakers, you know. But uh, even in 2014, uh, I was also in uh, Lugansk and uh, in uh, near uh, uh, city Shastya named and. Uh, I didn't saw that uh, there was some uh, problems with Russian speakers because uh, almost uh, everyone from Ukrainian side uh, who was soldier also was speaking like uh, a lot of more percent of people was speaking Russian and it uh, not an issue that someone wanted to shoot someone who is speaking Russian you know even now because uh, when uh, I am stopped uh, in car on a checkpoint and I speaking in, Ru in Russian no one saying nothing, you know, and if I speak in Ukrainian, everything is also fine, no problems. In 2014, you did you take some part in this war? Uh, yeah, I war uh, it in Misty Shastia at uh, Aydar uh, Battalion. But also like uh, the first question about the nazification, that. Um, as like uh, there was already the information about uh, how much uh, percentage in the elections got uh, right-wing people in Ukraine and it uh, for the last uh, elections it was as I remember 2% and it much more less than in any European country uh, so like uh, about what denazification we are saying and like if to bring uh, deeper and to understand how the Russian government is connected with uh, uh, right wing uh, like nationalists, Nazis, uh, all the people who was killing uh, people who was uh, uh, making some terror and the history brings us that they was uh, totally in connect that like uh, people in the government was supporting these people and uh, by their command they were killing uh, like anti-fascists, journalists, uh, different thinkers, uh, everyone. So like... You mean uh, in Russia? In Russia, yes. So like, what the fuck about what denazification we are saying if we need to denazificate uh, Russia for first of all. With their uh, like, with their political even views, you know, because uh, for now what they are doing, everyone is comparing Putin to Hitler and the Russia to Germany, you know, because they are trying to do something the same, like to bring uh, the Russian land back to the homeland and like the Hitler also was uh, started to do, he was bringing like German lands to the German and taking like what he thought was uh, Germans. So, okay, it's... Uh, Ukrainian never never wanted to occupy any country or uh, to I don't know destroy any nationality or something like this. Even like uh, I think before the war, before everything, a lot of uh, Russian was living and still living here, and like we in our unit have people from Russia also. Yeah. Some people say that despite the fact that the far right hasn't had much electoral success in Ukraine, they still have a lot of influence in society and they, they, that they have a lot of military power. For example, there's been various um, formations and parties of the far right, like the right sector, Svoboda and so on, but lately there is a tremendous amount of attention in the infamous Azov Battalion. Mm -hmm. And even people on, uh, on the other side, um, will admit that they are perceived as some kind of elite unit. Not only, in fact, uh, they are part of the official, they are officially part of the Ukrainian military, but also that they are seen as some kind of elite unit with um, uh, some of the best equipment. Um, how did we get to this point? How did Azov Battalion get so much attention 
um, and or so much power. How much is really the power they have? How powerful is I indeed their position? And uh, how did they come to the point to somehow represent the Ukrainian military in the minds of some people? It's also like uh, come from the 2014 because like uh, as a right sector, as a party, as a group, at the Maidan was represented by a small amount of people. But in the uh, media of Russia and uh, all the satellites, right sector was like everywhere. In every, I don't know, house, every building, every person is the right sector. And uh, like crazy Ukrainian nationalists and all that uh, stuff. So they uh, made good advertising for them. That's why right sector during Maidan became really a big thing. And then during the war, because like they was growing, growing, because like uh, every person was thinking, okay, to which battalion do I go uh, for war? And uh, like, okay, right sector, because like you know them. And uh, Azov one was in that uh, time like uh, much more smaller in the media represented. So like, and now we come into the same stuff. Like uh, Azov is represented in Russian media like a big, big, big uh, bubble, you know. Of course, they have military power. They had a military base because they also like official uh, part of national guard. And they like uh, military people, a lot of them, like mostly all, let's say, who involved in, in uh, the process of war and the process of their battalion. So, uh, of course, during, uh, after 2014, after the war, active part uh, at the east of Ukraine, uh, they had uh, grown their, uh, their power and their, like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, the surrounding, like uh, even this uh, previous uh, premier minister uh, who was uh, like uh, the minister who was the pol police uh, minister, uh, Avakov, he was also their friend and I think he's still their friend in some way. So like of course they, uh, as military people like uh, some other official uh, like some military people, some battalions, uh, they was working on uh, making their battalion better and better. And of course they got some uh, military supplies, but it's uh, not only them, it's like uh, um, the most uh, powerful military battalions, they have good supplies and better supplies than some usual uh, army battalions and uh, units. So it's uh, in my position, it's in my thinking, it's normal because also like for the moment when they have this uh, Mariupol city and they one of the like battalions who is still holding there inside the city and uh, Mariupol for now, as we know, almost doesn't have any uh, building which is still unbombed and undestroyed. So, like, of course, they have some military force and uh, military power, yeah. And for now, like, I don't see them in the, uh, like, in this political ground. I see them only in the military ground for the moment. During the war, they don't uh, put, I don't know, this uh, political statements or something like this. They make war, 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 because... Uh, also, as I see, a lot of them are dying each day because they are in the hottest uh, points, you know, in the hottest cities. Okay, about the second point um, and the, the region of Donbass and so on. Um, Russia says that uh, it was the Minsk agreement that was breached, that, that that's part of why they had to invade, to... to reinforce the Minsk agreement. <coughs> <coughs> However, some people I've interviewed said that in fact the, re the, bre the Minsk agreement was indeed breached by both sides, but probably uh, even more so from Russia than from Ukraine. What are your thoughts on that? I didn't uh, look on the Minsk agreement for the last time because like uh, for me Minsk agreement is a joke. All agreements with the enemy on this, uh, even 
in previous time was a joke because like uh, when I went to in 2014 it was first time when uh, they agreed on silence it was first Minsk agreement or something like this and uh, bombs was still flying people was dying and everything was uh, going on so like I don't know Minsk agreement is a just a joke from their side tell me about your experience in that war why did you choose to go in that war uh, because uh, it was a lot of uh, you know uh, fuse about this war like what's going on what's really going on what's not going on like a lot of media provocations about a lot of media information and uh, I was thinking that it's all right like uh, we have some people who also want to go and want to check by themselves to see what's going really going on like to get the information from the first uh, view from the people who was involved in this war and uh, I was in the unit of the people uh, who were natively uh, uh, from Lugansk city and they were starting uh, the war in the beginning when the Russian people came and started to do this protest, anti-Maidan, to put Ukrainian flags out, put Russian flags in and uh, all these uh, things uh, was going on so it was the moment from where they, they also started to participating in the war like uh, the, there was uh, starting to appear some Russian uh, separatist uh, uh, checkpoints they was attacking them and all the stuff then the war was going on more and more and they was uh, like part of this war so like uh, I was in the at that war uh, with the people who natively from like let's say this Russian speaking cities from Lugansk and they was uh, not pro russian they was uh, totally pro ukrainian uh, people and like they were in some uh, nationalist or nazis or something it was usual military people like who become military during the war because uh, before they was just usual people doesn't have anything uh, with the military during the life but they felt like they have to defend their community against some invaders. Uh, yes, they have this. felt that they need to defend themselves and their community because of invaders who came to their land and they didn't ask uh, for any help at that moment, you know. They didn't want that someone uh, can come and uh, was helping them because uh, there was no problem for them. And when they saw that uh, some people with... Uh, Rifles with uh, Kalashnikovs is making checkpoints, uh, trying to break uh, administration, city administration, uh, secret service uh, building, police station, and all the stuff. And when they saw that uh, it all came to that uh, that Russian invades, like with Girkin and all that uh, people, so of course they was uh, working like uh, partisans, like Ukrainian partisans. And on the third point, um, there is a global discourse going on, obviously, about the war um, in, between everyone, but uh, also within the global left. And there is a section of the global left that is quite susceptible to the Russian argumentation, uh, particularly in what uh, refers to NATO and the NATO expansion. And uh, they tend to focus a lot on criticizing NATO and NATO's responsibility about provoking this war. Mm -hmm. However, um, I have found that there is a distinct shift of narrative, uh, a distinctively different point of view coming from leftists and anarchists that come from any country bordering Russia, all the way from Finland to Kazakhstan. What do you think that means? What should that tell us? It should tell us that, uh, you know, people live in, uh, in the past, like in the 17th when Soviet Union was powerful and the NATO after war was starting to, uh, to grow, you know, and uh, it was uh, this Cold War, uh, Cold War stuff. So, uh, Soviet Union was supporting left people, communist people in Europe and United States and everywhere. And so, and they were supporting them, of course, and saying that uh, NATO is bad and uh, uh, 
European countries uh, should join uh, Soviet Union in some way or uh, and don't support like United States and all this stuff you know the history I guess and uh, now we have something similar some uh, parties uh, left-wing parties are uh, like uh, sponsored and uh, like working completely and closely for the last I guess more than 10 years with Russia so like uh, and the same in that way we have all also right-wing parties who is also working uh, for the last years with Russia making uh, like meetings in uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg I don't remember and like they all come and make some uh, talking, chit-chatting and like um, some people from uh, DNR from Donbass also uh, coming to these uh, meetings with the right wing and saying about what's going on in their uh, land you know so like it's completely mixed uh, uh, mixed uh, point of view, you know, they trying to change uh, uh, like that this is green, this is black, this is white, they all changing this because uh, now if you support Russia then you are anti-fascist, if you support uh, Ukraine then you are a Nazi, but like come on, if uh, some country invades other country, so who is uh, who is uh, making a mistake and who is making the aggression not the victim country who is like you know it's like uh, some kind of uh, victim blaming in different way you know so like to blame ukraine that they uh, struggle and that uh, they uh, in war with russia and that they didn't uh, make like okay come in to our land uh, take everything and uh, do what you want like come on like uh, we know from the past that they that Russia made a lot of uh, places like gray zones you know like Pridnestrovia it's also like in the end uh, what's it's nothing like Crimea it's also a gray zone Donbass is also a gray zone where people like they live uh, in the middle of nowhere like officially yeah and uh, they need to be someone but uh, it's hard for them because like officially it's totally changed so like uh, in my opinion that Russia is just uh, playing the game with changing uh, of uh, point of views like they and uh, this left-wing people who support them they only I don't know or they stupid or they earn money or what because like when I was also in Europe after the war in 2015 I went to Europe with uh, like lectures about the Maidan, about the war, about what's going on, about what I saw, what my opinion, about some hot topics which was like uh, what really was going on in like you know Odessa or something like this you know and uh, a lot of people uh, like it, there was different uh, point of views uh, but uh, when they hear uh, like the information directly from me they was like ah okay so it's like totally different because like they trying uh, not to look at official media like CNN you know like just uh, t telling but like uh, they looking at the media of Russia like Sputnik and Pogrom and uh, it's not uh, you know um, freedom media it's also pro-Russian media who making uh, like uh, different point of view, but uh, of um, but of pro-Russian side, you know. So and they believe to them that they are saying truth because it's like not uh, official uh, pro-Russian media, you know. And it's uh, in some uh, way it's hard to understand uh, other people who living far away from here. Like as you said, that uh, from Finland, from even Belarus, from uh, everywhere, Lithuania, Poland, uh, everyone knows that Russia is invader, that Russian is the enemy, that Russian is uh, I forgot the word imperialist. Uh, imperialist. Yes, everyone knows this, but why uh, we take like in German, and there could be people who like think another way. Like, 
It's only that hard to pass a few thousand kilometers and to talk with people in Lviv, you know, like this. Since you mentioned it, <coughs> I, I asked one more um, <coughs> comrade about this. What happened in Odessa? So, in Odessa happened a big, uh, let's say, big provocation. Because, like, uh, I was uh, on the phone with my friend. Uh, during uh, like this pro-Ukrainian march and he was uh, on the phone, he's, we was talking just what's going on and he was saying, oh, just a guy near me fall down because he was shot and like uh, then during uh, when I was uh, uh, collecting all the videos from the Odessa uh, to understand uh, by myself what's going on uh, by the time I understood that like there was Ukrainian pro-Ukrainian march, and there was like uh, like pro-Russian group who was uh, hardly armed with uh, even automatic weapons, with pistols, and there was uh, a line of police who was guarding them, and they were shooting at you pro-Ukrainian march with uh, weapons, uh, and before them was a police, so like. Uh, Pro-Ukrainian demonstration, of course, start to attacking them with rocks, uh, cocktail molotovs, and all the stuff. But like uh, police trying to anyway like spread, um, don't get uh, no 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 straight clashes. And in the end, this group of people who was uh, shooting, they just uh, like disappear, like went away by protection of the police because uh, chef of the police was pro-Russian and he was. Uh, like uh, involved in this stuff and in the end uh, when some people died from pro-ukrainian side of course uh, in the end uh, people went to kulikovo pole to union house uh, to like fight uh, continue the fight because like oh, come on it's uh, normal when someone dies and you are already completely angry and crazy about this you go on and trying to put uh, out the dangerous, you know, which is appears. Of course, they didn't know that uh, this uh, group of people just disappears. They didn't went to Union House. This group is just, they, I don't know what's happened to them, but they, no one uh, sees them later. So, and the Union House, it's also like, needed to understand that in Ukrainian, uh, in Ukraine, Union House, it doesn't mean that it's Union House, you know. It doesn't mean that uh, there is workers who is sitting inside it and like working on the unions and all this stuff. It's uh, a union house is uh, unions in Ukraine. It's completely different structure which doesn't work officially with the government and don't sit just in union house because it's called union house, you know. So like uh, there was a pro-Russian side in this union house. Of course, this, there was a fight, there was burning stuff, and because in Union House was uh, construction, there was some flammable materials, they flamed. Of course, there was a big uh, fire, and people was uh, dying because of it. And uh, But on the other part of the building, where was uh, uh, back exit, people was uh, freely, uh, like there was people standing, and the door was open and people was leaving the house and no one touched them. Everyone was just uh, leaving from it freely. Like pro, uh, like pro Ukrainian side didn't attack them when they come out from the building. They was uh, uh, trying to climb up to put the people down to help them because there was this uh, construction site, you know. They was trying to work out uh, to do something, to help people. And of course it's uh, bad and shitty when people dying like this in the fire and but this you know when it come to this that kind of level of aggression when people dying from the shootings and they dying from the fire it's yeah it's uh, in some way it's tragic but uh, i think that people who was uh, there from pro-ukrainian side they made uh, an effort to stop the people dying inside the house in this union house and uh, also like 
some people who was asking people from pro-Russian side to come inside Union House, they left the building uh, untouched because they also appear on the video. So maybe also like they understood something what's going on. Maybe they was in connection. I don't know because it's also we can uh, imagine anything. But uh, I'm only uh, like telling the story what I saw and what I heard correctly from my friends. So like for me it was uh, like the Russian side probably wanted to make a big big provocation on that uh, in Odessa and they made it. But the scale of it wasn't that uh, big because uh, in the end people was people and they just helped other people. Even if they are enemy and they, they have different views on everything. So we've been having a situation where the discourse is dominated by the presence of fascists and Nazis and everyone is talking about Azov and this and that. But at the same time, I've been going around Poland making reportage and seeing a nationwide mobilization from Polish anarchists and anti-fascists. And it's all like, it's all grown into this vast logistical network that gets support from all over Europe. Think, the whole buses and trucks coming from the UK, from Spain, from France, from Germany, bringing stuff to bring them here, to Lviv, and then here, right here. And they're all referencing, they're all doing this work for the resistance committee. What is the resistance committee? Resistance committee is uh, like a group of people who like you know it's uh, completely different people like from anarchists from just anti-fascist uh, from hooligans group and like let's say it's like what we was uh, doing for the past years in kiev like after maidan after all this stuff with like some concerts some uh, tournaments uh, some uh, i don't know with everything what we was going through and uh, in the end like because now we have a war we have this resistance committee we have this unit where a lot of different people uh, with different views even like uh, probably like some people don't uh, agree with view of other people but like in the end they are all together in one unit because like they have one uh, like point of view on the enemy you know so like in the Europe the same like there is a lot добре А можна поцікавитися хто ви і що ви тут поки робите Ми тут сидимо і знімаємо відео ми з тої школи Про школу Ні не про школу про війну Ну команду So we were saying that, roll back a bit, um, there is a consensus that this is an anti-authoritarian unit yep. that was um, started by a collaboration of anti-fascist uh, football hooligans and uh, groups of anarchists. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that, uh, how that collaboration started. Uh, that collaboration started like, if to take from the beginning it started after uh, Maidan after the war after all this stuff because the movement was weak in that point but uh, some people decided to start to growing the movement uh, start to like to make some uh, concerts to make some tournaments uh, to make some gatherings of people initiatives and like to grow it from the beginning so uh, I think that uh, that was the start of what we have now and like uh, like the week before the war started there was uh, a field training uh, combat field training uh, and uh, on the weekend uh, when the war started there was should be one more uh, field training but uh, at 24th of february the war started so yeah it's like it's uh, 
different people like anarchists, uh, hooligans from Arsenal Kiev and uh, other guys who wanted to uh, like to be like a group if the war starts because like already in that time a lot of uh, uh, things was saying that the war probably should start soon and if even in that time I'm by myself I was thinking that okay it's possible but I don't believe that it will start now because uh, I didn't want that it started you know of course like who wants the war to be started so uh, I didn't uh, appear on the first training but I was uh, thinking that okay we will come to the second training and we'll uh, join all the other people yeah. so it's one of the way how it started you know so these um football hooligans you're talking about the kiev arsenal they have already some some past behind them uh, there's even a documentary film about their action i think it's the hoods clan Yes. Right. Tell me, tell me a bit about the history of the Hoods clan and uh, what uh, what's been uh, their development. Yeah, it's uh, the movie we made like a year ago or something like this. Uh, Hoods Hoods clan, yeah. And uh, the history you can see at that at that movie, uh, but in the general, in short version, it's like in 2004, 2006. Uh, around that time we already had some anti-fascist uh, group in Kyiv but uh, we also have this Arsenal Kyiv club which didn't have a big uh, ultras group or hooligans group and some people decided to come to the games uh, get known each other with the other guys it was apolitical at the time so like we started to visit the games going to away games participating in fights and it was like some kind of plaz d'arm uh, how the movement uh, anti-fascist movement in uh, ukraine even i could say and in kiev was building at the time so like during uh, this time till uh, maidan and after maidan after the war a lot of uh, fights was like field fights street fights away games home games uh, visited uh, and uh, participated yeah. so yeah it's like big uh, big movement in the like in the realities of ukraine not very big in realities of european uh, movements but anyway like uh, have uh, their own position like we have our own position in all like movement in Ukraine and in Europe also. So, uh, just before the war started, they, these football anti-fascists, they joined with anarchists and formed this anti-authoritarian unit. How was it in the beginning and how is it developing now, one month in? In the beginning it was, you know, not uh, totally clear, uh, even in in the beginning of the war like uh, even we have this group of people not everyone totally understood how we're gonna get weapon where we should go how it uh, will work out and everything but also we have like at this particular unit we have uh, a commander who is have a military no knowledge and he is working in the military for all this time and he's like a friend of mine and I know him from the really uh, past so like it's a friend also of uh, some people who now with us in unit so he said uh, to the guys come here and we will work, work it out and that's how like around let's say 20 people in the first days come here uh, and in that days I was in another part of the city of the Kiev with a also with our guys and some uh, random people uh, we had uh, our like not checkpoint but uh, observation point because it was the end of Kyiv uh, on the Obolon district yeah. and like a few days like three days of the beginning of the war I was at that place and then I came here like when I came here of course I stayed because like he was uh, my friends and uh, all people I almost knew before. 
And how has it been going? It seems to be uh, there's much, much more people now. Yeah, it's now like uh, 50 people. And uh, it's going like much more better because like uh, we now have... Uh, we still had this time before and we uh, use it for training because uh, people was... Uh, not everyone knew like this military things before. So everyone was training, we have uh, coaches who was coming and who have experience uh, in this stuff. So we was uh, like uh, fooling our heads with knowledges all the time. Yeah. What has been the significance of internationalist solidarity to empowering this unit? Uh, you know, it's uh, from different angles. It was. We have people from Europe who joined us, people from Canada who joined us and uh, we have uh, different people from almost all countries, from Brazil, from United States who was writing uh, and saying that we want to come, we want to join the unit, we, how we can do it and all the stuff and we trying to communicate with them and to make it uh, more uh, correctly all the stuff because like it's not that easy to put uh, a foreign person to the unit because it's still some bureaucracy with this stuff but uh, the support uh, from Europe is uh, very big like we have now cars it's almost enough cars for all of these 50, 50 people we can put everyone in car with our stuff and uh, drive somewhere in some other place you know because like we have this help from the, our friends from Europe and all over the world who was helping us. Also, like everyone now have uh, vests, plates, everything, equipment, all what we needed. Everyone help, have this. And also, like when we have extra, we help to the people who was in different military uh, units who need this help, who like uh, on the front line, but. Um, Someone have a friend and he's saying he's in the front line, but he doesn't have nothing only an AK rifle and nothing more So like uh, when we hear something like this we trying always to help with what uh, is bringing to us from Europe We give to other people also because it's important uh, Not only to support us, but if we have a possibility we support other people also what are you hoping for, or let's say, what are the prospects for from now on for internationalist solidarity and for integration of uh, internationalists into the unit or into uh, the logistical network? I don't know. For now, it's uh, hard to say how the war will go on because, like, uh, Russian side use like uh, military force which is destroying everything, you know. So like if uh, in the closest future they won't start, uh, sh they won't shelling uh, like all these uh, peaceful cities, uh, what they are doing. I guess there will be like much more uh, total war with them like which will spread uh, everywhere because like uh, people will continue to join because like uh, now we also have people who are waiting like uh, they have a meeting point in Warsaw and they will meet each other and someone will bring them here and we will decide by uh, by the way how we gonna like uh, work work it out but like uh, i think that um, uh, supply chain is now working very well because like uh, people from europe really build a good network and also not uh, only supply chain they also help for people who are uh, running away from uh, war like uh, relatives uh, friends uh, girlfriends wives uh, children everywhere Everyone, they help everyone. They finding uh, a place to stay. They uh, also like uh, giving some money to live and uh, all the stuff. They uh, helping with documents. So yeah, it's uh, really important. They also have this uh, 
points uh, on the borders where they get uh, even like just people who come into the border usual people not from the movement not from not our friends just usual people they come and when they can help they help them they bring them by the car to the germany they bring him by the car to the poland so or wh where they need so like uh, it's really big network it's really big supply chain and people are really crazy they really good uh, i don't know supporters let's say or how to say but they are big people people from the big uh, letter p you know yeah. and finally my standard last question is an open one and goes like this <clears throat> given everything that we have discussed in this interview and given the broader discourse around the topics that we have discussed what do you want to add what do you want to say uh... I want to say that, like, uh, from my opinion, as uh, I was also always started uh, trying to, like, to study what the conflicts about, like, in different countries, not uh, like you know, even in Afghanistan, in Syria, with Kurds, with everyone, like in the past, in the future, in now, uh, I was always trying to study them and like to get the information from different point of views. And I would say that like people uh, who is anti-fascist, anti-Ossorian, uh, left uh, wing and all this stuff, they should really think twice, three times, more times and try to uh, dig the information, try to find uh, uh, persons who will give them more information. If they like really support uh, Russian side, they need to start to dig in, they need to start to work on it, on their knowledges about what was in in uh, past, what was uh, the reality of Russia is now, how the Russian government destroying all different thinkers, opposition, politicians, journalists uh, everyone everyone and that it's not the state which is could be supported but by any human person you know it's just impossible because from my understanding uh, i think that people are just blinded or uh, they're i don't know someone uh, told them a lot of bullshit uh, a lot of uh, things that uh, isn't true and they just believe it uh, blindly so I really wanted to like bring the idea to the people who will see this that please like learn more like try to dig everything and like uh, when you dig when you find uh, from every point of view you can build uh, your some way point of view you know and only then try to make this uh, uh, solutions or uh, like uh, not solutions uh, conclusion. conclusions yes conclusion make conclusions in the end and not uh, uh, only because uh, your party leader your group leader saying that this is true we support this we don't support that it doesn't work like this like the world is changed yeah. thank you very much thank you too